All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Allie Smith and I'm speaking today from the Cornell Lab in Ithaca, New York. And today we're gonna celebrate the incredible milestone of two million sound recordings archived in the Macaulay Library. Over the next hour, I'll be joined by colleagues from the Cornell Lab and from sound recordists from all around the world to give you a tour through the history of the Macaulay Library, learn about sound recording in general and highlight some of the amazing recordings within this collection and the people behind them. I have a couple of tech notes before we begin. Um, tonight, we'll be streaming this webinar on both Zoom and YouTube. Um, feel free to use the chat to ask us questions. We won't have time to answer them on camera, but we do have moderators from the Cornell Lab who are ready to answer your questions in the chat, and they'll be able to type out some answers for you. Um, closed captioning is available on Zoom. If you'd like to turn captions on or off, you can click the captions button at the bottom of the screen. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded, and we're going to post it on YouTube later this week if you'd like to watch again or share with anybody else. To start off this celebration, I want to introduce you all to the current director of the Macaulay Library, Dr. Mike Webster, who's going to give us some background about why birds sing and about the Macaulay Library. Um, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thanks a lot, Allie. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And I'm thrilled to see so many people showing up from all parts of the world to uh, celebrate sounds with us. Um, so let me quickly start my screen sharing here. Okay, great. There we go. Okay, so I guess the, the first thing that I want to say is that people have been out there in nature recording the sounds of birds and other animals for decades. 
Um, and since it began in 1929, the Macaulay Library has collected and curated and preserved those recordings. Uh, the, the size of the Macaulay collection has grown over the years, in particular once we partnered with eBird, which allowed people to directly upload the recordings to the archive. Um, and thanks to all that growth, the Macaulay um, collection, the archive has grown substantially. Um, and just this past fall in October, we hit a very significant milestone, as Ali already mentioned, when we archived the two millionth recording. Uh, that two millionth recording was of a yellow browed toady flycatcher recorded by Marcelo Barbosa in Para, Brazil. And tonight, it is my very great pleasure to play that two millionth recording for all of you. Okay, great. So the, a, a wonderful recording uh, captures the voice of that little tiny toady flycatcher. Um, and, and that recording, along with about 2 million others, are in the Macaulay Library now, um, along with tens of millions of photos and thousands and thousands of videos. Um, in the early days, the, the audio recordings were stared on, stored on magnetic tape. And this photo here shows um, some of the Macaulay team in our storage room with some of those tapes showing them off. Um, but reaching 2 million recordings was really made possible by changing technology, technology that allowed people to record digitally and to upload those recordings and for us at this end to store the digital copies. 2 million recordings is an outstanding number. It's an astounding number. And I, I have to say, I, I honestly never dreamed that the collection would grow that large, certainly not in the time that I was here. Um, and thinking about that number probably raises questions for a lot of you. Uh, questions like, why do we even need sound archives? What are they good for? Why do they exist? Um, sound archives exist because each recording in an archive is an incredibly valuable piece of scientific data. Each recording captures the sounds of a particular individual bird at a particular place and a particular time. And so these recordings capture variation in the sounds of birds over individuals and across space and across time. And those sorts of data are incredibly valuable to scientists doing research aimed at a better understanding of the natural world. They're also valuable, oh, sorry, so science. I um, mean, they're also valuable for conservation efforts, for example, by enabling acoustic monitoring of threatened habitats. Uh, recordings like these are also useful for educators teaching science classes at all levels. And they're even valuable to artists that want to incorporate the sounds of nature into their work. So that's why we exist. But another question some of you might have is why 2 million recordings? Do we really need that many? Does the Macaulay Library really need over 14,000 recordings of a single species, the song sparrow? And after all, you know, once you've heard a few recordings of song sparrows, you kind of know what that species sounds like. But the reality is that the birds, the sounds that birds make incredibly vary. They're incredibly variable. Um, they, uh, there's variation not just between species, but across populations and across regions of a, of a single species. And even within a population, there's a lot of variation between individuals, so males versus females, young versus old. And even within an individual, you know, most individuals don't have just a single song, but they have an entire repertoire of song. And they also have on top of their songs, they have calls, well, alarm calls, warning calls, contact calls, begging calls. Um, and their vocalizations might even vary with weather or ecological conditions. Um, so there's a lot of variation out there. And to study that variation and to understand why it exists, um, to decipher the language of birds, and to train computer models to identify and monitor birds, we need a lot of recordings.
And then some of you might be wondering, why do birds make sound at all? Um, the answer to that one's actually pretty simple. Um, birds use sound as well as their plumage color and, and physical flashy displays to talk to each other. Um, they use sounds to defend the territory, to call others to food, to warn of approaching danger, um, to attract a mate. Um, birds vocalize for a whole variety of reasons, and birds are really exceptionally noisy animals, much more so than mammals or insects or, or most other animals you think. Birds make a lot of noise. And so a, a large and growing sound archive like the Macaulay Library is central to deciphering the sounds that birds make. It's central to understanding why and how birds make the sounds that they do. And it's central to helping preserve birds so that they continue to sing. But there is also one other reason why the Macaulay Library exists. Um, the Macaulay Library exists because those of us who can't actually travel to Brazil can still go to the Macaulay Library and hear what a yellow-browed toady flag catcher sounds like. The Macaulay Library and other sound archives, we are here to share the sounds of birds and other animals. We're here because the sounds that birds make are simply amazing. And so what I wanna do just for a couple of minutes here before we move on is to share and celebrate some of those amazing sounds that birds make. Um, for a lot of people, um, it's fun to, and, and sort of educational to um, see the song, see the sounds as well as listen to them. And, and scientists do that with something called a spectrogram. And so here's a photo of a, of a song sparrow and a spectrogram of a song sparrow song. And a spectrogram is just a visualization of sound um, where the x-axis along the bottom is time and pitch or frequency is along the y-axis on the side. And each blob in this picture, the sonogram, the spectrogram here, is a note that the bird's um, uttering. And so I look at the spectrogram, I look at a lot of these things, and so I can look at this and I can see it's this bird sounds like high note, low note, high note, low note, high note, trill, buzz, whir. And so let's hear what it actually sounds like. So high note, high note, high note, trill, buzz, whir. Um, to really appreciate it, though, and help train your eyes and your ears to work together, it's it's useful to slow that song down. And so I'm going to play it again at half speed and follow along and listen to the high note, high note, high note, or low note, high note, low note, high note, trill buzz were um, with both your eyes and your ears. So that's that's the song of a song sparrow, a song of a song sparrow. And what I want to do now is just play a few more songs of different birds. Um, I'm going to show a movie spectrogram. So it's a moving spectrogram, and you can follow with your eyes as you're listening with your ears to each of these birds. So we'll start with a wood thrush. So this is a common bird that sings up here in the uh, northeastern U.S. during the spring. Um, and it has a beautiful flute-like sound. And so here is the song of a wood thrush. Okay, and again, to really appreciate it, we're gonna slow it down now and you can see how intricate and otherworldly the sound really is. So if you're practicing, listening with your ears and watching with your eyes. <laughs> I love that one. So another bird, uh, crested oropendula. Um, oropendulas have a soft spot in my heart. I did my PhD dissertation work on oropendulas. I love them for many reasons, but one of the reasons is they just have amazing voices. They make sounds like no other bird can. So here is the sound of a crested oropendula. Amazing, it doesn't even sound like an animal. So I'm gonna, to really astound you, I'm gonna slow it down and just pay attention to what this sound is, what this bird sounds like.
Utterly amazing. So I hear that and I, I wonder not only what is the bird saying, what's it, what message is it conveying, but how does it make that amazing sound? It's like plucking down a harp. Okay, one last one. Uh, we can't talk about bird song without talking about the, the New World Wrens. Um, they are true songsters. They make amazing sounds. Here is a Pacific Wren. And again, slow down. That is just utter jazz improvisation. It's just amazing that that little bird can make those kinds of sounds so rapidly. So listening to those amazing sounds, that was made possible by just a few of the very many dedicated recordists that have recorded the birds that they see and then have submitted their recordings to the Macaulay Library. Um, and in closing, I just want to extend my very, very heartfelt and sincere thanks to those many contributors. And with that, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and turn it back over to Allie. Thanks, Allie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. That's that's really cool. I love seeing those spectrograms in slow motion. That like really shows how incredible these birds are. Um, so we we made it to two million recordings, and that's an incredible milestone. Um, but it's taken a really long time to get there. And right now I am physically in the Macaulay Library in the collections room. You can see all the shelves behind me that are filled with thousands and thousands of physical tapes of sound recordings. I'm going all the way back until the 1930s. And this room really represents the, the full history of the collection. And um, over here, uh, we have Glenn Seeholzer, who <laughs> is gonna join us today um, to talk oh, a little bit. hello. <laughs> to talk a little bit about the history of sound recording. Um, yeah, take it away, Glenn. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Macaulay Library, or at least the physical side of it. Um, the The question that we should be asking ourselves is, what's the oldest sound recording in the archive? And um, we have two. There's two, actually. It's a tie for first place for the oldest. Here we have a song sparrow that was recorded by Arthur Allen and Peter Paul Kellogg uh, on 18th of May, 1929 in uh, Stewart Park, right here in Tompkins County, New York. And let's listen to this, because that take us back almost 100 years back in time. LNS catalog number 16737. And then recorded shortly thereafter, or in the same outing, is this uh, Rose Breast of Grosbeak. Let's take a listen to that. LNS catalog number now imagine, 16968. Imagine what it was like before this bird. Back over to the recording on film. Thanks, Ellie. So that really takes us back. And what we're going to do for the next couple minutes is actually talk a little bit about the history of sound recording and i'm going to tilt this up so you guys can see me a little better um and so these recordings were made not by one person but by a team of people because the equipment at the time was so heavy and bulky that you really needed a team to operate it here's an example of what a team might have looked like that's actually peter paul kellogg there the older gentleman on, on the ground doing playback for uh, one of the other key contributors to the ML collection, Randy Little. And they were using equipment much like this, reel-to-reel, -reel, where, they, where they'd spool reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tape, often hand crank it to get it started to make these recordings. 
And so these these two men were the pot were some of the pioneers of the field bioacoustics. Oh yeah. And they're using things like this. So you can definitely imagine how you need two people to be uh to, to get these kind of these recordings back in the day. I'm gonna throw that over there. Um and so that was the start of the uh, the uh, the Macaulay Library, which was at the time uh, the Library of Natural Sounds. Uh, and Arthur Allen and Peter Paul Kellogg went on to found the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And they're really the some of the pioneers of bioacoustics, um, basically popularizing the field uh, that we all now uh, is used in so many different contexts. And so thanks to their efforts, we now have a representative, thanks to the efforts that they started, this basic field of bioacoustics, we now have representative recordings of nearly all bird species in the world. And we all have them now right at our fingertips in, in, the, Merlin, uh, in the Merlin Bird ID app. But now we're gonna think about how we got to that point. How from a century ago, getting our first recordings of a song sparrow and a rose-breasted grosbeak, it's now having representative recordings of all the birds of the world. What was, the, what was that process like? And what was it like trying to build that, that collection? And so think back to a time not too long ago when the vocalizations of almost uh, all species outside of North America and Europe were unknown, except in some cases the local inhabitants of a region, but they're almost certainly undocumented by recordings. And so there's not any living memory of what it was like to experience, what the experience was like of learning the soundscape of the North American avifauna with no resources or references like we have today. But today we're gonna to be joined by Mark Robbins, who was a key contributor from the generation of new tropical ornithologists who document the sounds of the South American and Central American avifauna for the first time. Uh, Mark is the uh, outgoing collections manager of the Department of Ornithology at the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute and one of the most prolific, prolific contributors to the Macaulay Library audio archive with almost 13, 14,000 audio recordings representing 2,728 species from 31 countries. He spent a lifetime in the field sound recording using all, all generations of technology. And so he's gonna share some uh, of his memories from, the, from, from that time when he was just getting started. Uh, so Mark, won't you, won't you join us? You can turn your uh, video on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Glenn. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, and so, to get the conversation started, uh, we're gonna listen to a recording you made um, in 1983 uh, in, on the Rio Maniti on the south bank of the uh, Amazon River in Peru. Um, and I believe I need a share screen. Desktop too. Okay. So let's listen to this. LNS catalog number 37513. <laughs> we're listening to is that distant, repetitive, low, low sound. You can also hear a wall of insect noise, uh, some of the uh, feedback from the microphone. And so, Mark, could you tell us a bit about uh, this recording, when it was made, how it was made? What was it like making the recording? Well, as you noted, there was a, quite a bit of background noise, a number of uh, insects, frogs. And at the time, that was made pre-dawn. And all I knew at that time was this bird was up in the sub canopy, and I had no idea what it was. And as you pointed out, at that time, there was no Merlin. There was no online. There were no resources. And so you had sometimes spend days attempting to determine uh, what a species was until you could actually see it. In this particular case, I left the field there in Peru in August of 1983, not knowing what that vocalization was. And I sent 
my recordings to Ted Parker, who was one of the experts at that time. And he goes, well, that's a collared puffbird. And that's how I figured that out because I could never track uh, the bird down in the canopy because it was always uh, singing when it was fairly dark. And so who's who's Ted Parker? Um, can you tell us a little bit about him? He's a super important figure in the field of neotropic, neotropical bioacoustics and ornithology. I wish I had a couple of hours to answer that, but I'll try to do it in just a few minutes. Um, he was a legendary neotropical ornithologist. At the time of his uh, untimely death in uh, August of 1993, when he died in a plane crash surveying birds in southwestern Ecuador, he could identify as many as over 500 species of birds at a single site in places like Manu National Park, uh, Explorers Inn uh, in uh, eastern Peru uh, along the base of the Andes. So that's phenomenal. And you think about it, identifying over 500 species, and many of those species have multiple vocalizations. That's extraordinary. And he learned that all pr pretty much on his own. And at that time of his uh, death, he had contributed over 10,000 recordings to Macaulay. And up until just a few years ago, that was still the most in, by any individual in the Macaulay Library. So up until just you know, a handful of years, and he died in 93, 10,000 audio recordings, extraordinary contribution. And so, but, so, yeah, let's put that in context, too, for what it was like to record back then, because we didn't have, right now, a modern piece of recording equipment is about this this big. Wow. Right? And he was using this massive reel-to-reel, -reel, maybe 20 pounds of lead and steel, and that's not even including the uh, eight D cells that you have to put in the back of it. Right. Um, and so you can, and you also record on on similar kind of technology. And so, what was what was it like recording with this kind of uh, technology? It was a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll say, like you mentioned, it was so heavy, it was awkward, um, cumbersome, and things changed in the early 1970s when uh, Sony produced this. Uh, called a TCM 5000 cassette recorder. It was much lighter weight. Uh, it took C batteries, uh, had a counter on it. You didn't have to exchange those uh, magnetic reel-to-reel -reel tapes. You could just stick in another cassette. And so that revolutionized uh, recording in the field because it was, it was truly a portable machine, unlike what you showed earlier, which was, it was limited where you could carry that, particularly if you were in difficult field conditions. And what was it like? Um, and so now we can, when we make a recording on, on our phones or, or with, with these digital recording devices, we have a really easy, fast pipeline for uploading the, the audio to Macaulay Library um, through the eBird like managed media tools. And so, but in, 19, in the 1980s, 1970s, what was the process like for archiving a recording? That is sharing that recording with the world. Well, the first thing we would do is um, you would listen to each cut and you would fill out a form from the Macaulay Library. And it would probably take you three to five minutes to fill out that paper form. And then once you'd done that for every cut on that cassette, you would send the cassette with a summary of what was on each cassette and those data forms. And then that would be all processed at the library. And you can imagine how time consuming that was for everybody on both ends of that. Yeah, we had a, at, at some points, we had, I don't know, up to 15 staff, dedicated audio engineers working here, uh, helping manage the, the recordings that were mailed physically a, on reel to reel cassettes here duplicate to create the um, the the recordings, the archive that we can see back here. Um, and so it was a really different time, but still kind of what connects us, what connects all these generations is essentially how much fun it is to record bird sounds, how beautiful they are, as Mike mentioned, and the kind of thrill of discovery. And I guess, I mean, in, in your words, Mark, what, what's beautiful about sound recording to you? Well, every aspect of it, but you, you don't have to go to an exotic place to appreciate 
uh, the thrill of recording something as, as common as an eastern wood peewee in, in eastern North America during the summer. Just uh, I get a thrill out of recording a nice recording of that and then, you know, uploading that on your eBird checklist that you're making a contribution. It doesn't have to be, you know, in some remote jungle, uh, in some remote place uh, of this of the world, you can make a valuable contribution uh to science. And as we all appreciate the world is changing so fast, it's important that we document everything, whether it's birds, amphibians, mammals, and you know, the Macaulay Library is much more than birds. What's, uh, yeah, so what's a good example of, of the ways bird sounds have changed through time? Well, th there was a study published very recently about how the song of the white-throated sparrow, it's a species found in Eastern North America, and it looks like its range, its winter range distribution is moving north with climate change. Some researchers took um, recordings from the Macaulay Library and showed that this common species its voice had changed across the entire continent from a three-noted song to a, no, a two-noted song in just a few decades. So that's just one example of what these recordings can do uh, in a short amount of time. Yeah, that, thanks, Mark. And for those interested, um, you can look, there's actually an All About Birds article about that very um, study and for people in, in Eastern North America or, or, the, or the Midwest, it's likely you can go out and, and hear both those song types of white-throated sparrows as they begin the call this spring. Um, they should be calling on their wintering grounds as they start moving farther north. It'd be really cool to go out and document where those individuals are on their wintering grounds, for instance. So um, yeah, lots to do, lots still to do. We, we now know what all the birds sound like, but we don't know what they're gonna sound like in 50 years, 100 years. And so it's really important that we're documenting these things consistently to understand this. This is a, it's an amazing experiment we're all running as, as a community, just collecting these, these data through time. Um, well, Mark, thanks so much for, for, for joining us. Um, I'm gonna well, let this back to Allie and we're gonna continue on with uh, the rest of the, uh, rest of the celebration. All right, bye y'all. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Glenn and Mark. Um, that was a really fascinating look at some of the history behind sound recording. Um, so Glenn and Mark spoke a little bit about how important older recordings are for our understanding of how birdsong changes over time. And this room that Glenn and I are sitting in right now is full of thousands and thousands of recordings um, from the last century, uh, but they're all on physical tapes like this one here, um, rather than, um, yeah, they're all on these physical tapes. Um, and one of our goals here is to make these older recordings, all these tapes accessible online so that anyone in the world, any of you watching right now um, can access these and learn from them. And we do that by digitizing these tapes. And the, the process of digitizing um, is, is pretty fiddly, kind of complicated, and it can be a many hour or even many day long um, process from start to finish in some cases. Um, so to show it to you here, we put together a short video that shows that process that I will play for you now. We're in the collections room in the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab in Ithaca, New York. The shelves in this room contain thousands of physical tapes in many formats of sound recordings of birds and other animals. Today, we'll be digitizing this open reel tape that was recorded in Kenya in 1981 by ornithologist Jennifer Horn. According to the data sheet associated with this tape, this is a recording of a black-colored barbet, a medium-sized bird found in the forests of southern Africa. We bring the tape into a digitization studio, which has the specialized equipment that we need for this task. The tape gets loaded onto the machine and a strip of white leader tape is spliced onto the end of the magnetic tape. The tape is currently on the reel backwards, so we need to rewind it before digitizing it. To do that, we thread the tape through the machine and onto an empty reel and rewind. Next, we clean the machine. This is an older tape that's beginning to degrade and it shed a little bit while rewinding. This part of the machine is responsible for reading the tape, so it's important to keep it clean to minimize interference. Now we're ready to digitize. We thread the tape back onto its original reel, set the speed of the tape, press a button to engage the rollers and maintain a constant tension, and play. 
As the tape rolls over the playheads, it's turned into an electrical signal, which is then converted to a digital signal by an A to D converter and then sent to a nearby computer. This tape is 24 minutes long, so we wait for the whole tape to finish playing before moving on to the next step. Once it's finished, we can archive the recordings that were on the tape. A single tape may contain many recordings, so let's edit and archive the one that we're interested in. We apply archival edits of trimming and normalizing, and adding silence to clarify where segments of the same bird start and stop. We can then enter the important metadata that describes the recording. This data came from a form that the recordist filled out in the past, but data can also come from field notes, other spreadsheets, or even from voice announcements on the tape itself. The final step is to upload it to the Macaulay Library. Now this recording is part of our digital archive and is available online to anybody in the world who wants to listen. Awesome. So right now, if you were to go onto the Macaulay Library's website and look at those 2 million recordings, um, about 8% of them, around 150,000 recordings total, came from these tapes behind me that went through that process that we just saw. Um, and the rest of those recordings, the other 92% are digital recordings. And most of those came from people like all of you who are watching right now, who recorded either on their phone or with a microphone and submitted those recordings to us through their eBird checklists. Uh, because recording is so much more accessible today than analog recording was in the past, um, we've really seen a major increase in the number of people recording in the last several years, uh, which is what's led us to reaching this 2 million recordings um, in our archive, this milestone. And these 2 million recordings are having a really incredible impact, uh, both in research and in education. And um, Glenn, as the curator of the Macaulay Library, um, part of your job is to is to keep up with the <laughs> with the scientific research that uses the collection. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about what some of that research looks like? Uh, yeah. So there's there's so much happening. It's it's actually really hard to keep track because um, we send out recordings to researchers. They use it for the thing that they they, they said they're going to use it for, and then they go off and use it for something completely different. And it's and it's really exciting to see all the different ways that recordings can be repurposed and the new questions that people come up with them uh, for them. Um, so recordings are used in like a wide variety of fields, taxonomies, uh, evolution, speciation research, uh, the field of bioacoustics and, and bioacoustic monitoring for conservation. Um, and I think at, at the heart of uh, bioacoustics is behavior. Uh, this is essentially an animal behavior. And um, today we actually have with us, uh, an avian behavioral expert, um, Dr. Karen Odom. She's, she's an assistant professor at the University of the Pacific in, in California. And she uses, uh, the ML archive in a really interesting and fascinating way. Um, and she's really one of the act leaders of an area of research, uh, concerning, uh, female bird song. And so she'll be updating us on her progress documenting and understanding this really unappreciated but extremely active uh, vocal lives of female birds. So Karen, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and yeah, let, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, about your work. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here today to tell you about my research on female bird song, but I am especially excited to be here to tell you about the exciting research that can be done with collections like Macaulay Library. And so first off, why are female bird songs interesting? Why do we want to study them? Well, um, historically, birdsong was thought to be primarily a male behavior. So when people were originally recording or observing bird songs or studying bird songs, they were often recording um, or studying the songs of males. And birdsong for quite a while was thought to be primarily a male behavior. However, um, in recent decades, we have started to realize that female birdsong is a lot more common than we previously thought. 
And specifically, my colleagues and I have been able to show that female song is fairly widespread, that this is a behavior that occurs in not just a few species, but it occurs throughout the songbird family tree and a lot of really different and diverse species. And, um, and, and then something else interesting that we were able to show, which I think really emphasizes why it's important to study and understand female bird song specifically, is that we think that females sang in the ancestor of all songbirds. We were able to use phylogenetic reconstruction. Aaron, to were, were, you, were you gonna share your screen? I think you had a I was, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. I yeah, thought yeah, you I, made some beautiful slides. I, I just want to make sure everyone yeah. can see them. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, so here we go. Thanks for stopping me now before I got too far. Um, okay, sure. So there you go. Can you, can you see that? Yep, that looks good. Okay, great. Um, okay, so, so as I was saying, um, we were able to show that Female bird song is not only widespread, but the probably the ancestor of all songbirds. Um, females were singing in in that ancestor too, and so and so what this means is that female song evolved really early on, and that female songbirds have been singing for millions of years alongside male song, and their songs have been diversifying, and and there's a wide array of species with female song today. Um, and so, so it's a really very interesting behavior, um, and I would say really relatively underexplored. And so, um, and so the other thing that I really love about female bird songs, and this goes for bird song in general, but female bird song can be really diverse. And, and so I want to show you a few different examples of female bird songs. So this ranges from everything like species like this white crowned sparrow, where males and females both look the same, but it turns out males and females actually sound the same too. This is the song of the female. And if you know the white crowned sparrow, you can tell it sounds really similar to the male. Um, however, there are species like this canyon wren where both males and females sing. However, the female song is really quite different. The females kind of have their own song um, that's different than the male song. And, um, and so I'll play that for you here. First off, it's really buzzy. And it's also this rising song. And comparatively, the male song is this really pure tone descending song. So, so this female song is really different than the male song. And then we have species like the scrub jay, and actually a lot of members of the scrub jay genus, females give this rattle call. And, and this is interesting because the male actually has nothing like a rattle call. There's nothing in his repertoire like that. And we think that it's a call that females specifically use for their own form of territory defense. And so that's the scrub jay calling. And that clicking sound is the rattle. And again, only the females do that. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, I want to play for you a, a few different songs by these neotropical wrens. Um, I think it was um, Mike mentioned earlier, somebody mentioned that the that wrens in general just have really, really beautiful songs. Um, but then in some species, the males and the females actually combine their songs into these duets. And in some species, um, they can be so highly coordinated that it can sound like a single bird species, uh, so, sorry, a single individual um, or single bird singing. And um, so first I'll play for you this Rufus and White Wren. Um, this is a, sort of a simpler duet where the male sings first and then the female is going to overlay and sing her higher pitched song. So the male starts lower and then the female sings. But then we have the buff-breasted wren where the male is going to sing two lower notes and then you're going to hear this 
series of high to low notes and the female sings the high part, the male sings the low part, but it's an almost perfect unison and it happens really, really fast. And then um, lastly, um, but certainly not least, I'll play for you the happy wren, which similarly, the male sings these lower parts. Um, he finishes his, his, his song with uh, two fast uh, lower notes. And then the female chimes right in almost seamlessly going from high to low notes, um, such that it's really difficult to even tell where the male song ends and where the female song starts. And so what I was interested to do as a postdoc at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is I was interested to look at how complex are female songs and how do they vary across a wide range of species and, and, and are they as complex as male songs and how do they compare to male songs. And so to do this, I used Macaulay Library and um, in all of the wonderful songs available in that collection, and specifically um, focusing on species where there were male and female songs in the collection. And so I ended up with a data set of 138 species covering 40 different songbird families. And um, it took me and a whole army of Cornell undergraduates, our Cornell students, in order to um, label all of these songs so that we could extract measurements in this song, um, Raven sound analysis software. And so um, in the end, we ended up with over 100,000 birdsong notes that we labeled so that we could extract measurements from those songs. And, um, and so here is the outcome of, of what that data looked like then when we put it in statistical software. So we have species, like I told you before, where um, the canyon wren male and female songs differ. And when we plot the measurements taken from all of those songs, we can see that, the, that these measurements differ as well and that they fall into a different acoustic space. Um, versus if you have a song like the superb fairy wren, where the male and female song is really very similar, the male and female songs overlap statistically in this acoustic space. And so using um, that kind of process, we can actually measure songs and song variation across a wide range of species and, and, and then plot them on phylogeny. And in the end, what we were able to conclude from this study is that male and female songs are actually really similarly complex. Male and female songs may not be exactly the same, but male and female songs are really diverse and complex in many songbird species. And so, so far I've told you a lot about what we um, what we already know about female bird songs, but this information really only comes from about a quarter of, uh, of songbird species, and, and there are about 73% of songbird species that we don't even really know what the female singing behavior or female vocal behavior is like. Um, so there's still a ton to learn. And so to try to get at this, uh, my colleagues and I, in, in uh, collaboration with the Macaulay Library, have uh, created this uh, female bird song project, a citizen science project, in order to encourage um, people like you, people who really love and enjoy recording bird songs, to, um, to contribute to the discovery of female bird song by contributing their recordings to these collections. So thank, thank you everyone for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. That's fascinating. Yes, thank um, you. Okay, so we have we have 2 million sound recordings, and that alone is incredible. Um, and we've shared with all of you tonight just some of the things that we've been able to do with these recordings so far. Um, but we want to keep doing more to help birds and to help people learn about them. And that means the next thing we want to do is to get to 3 million recordings next, and then 4 million and beyond. And we can do that with your help. Um, even if you've never recorded a bird in your life before. Um, so here with me today is also, in addition to Glenn, we also have Jay McGowan, who is a project leader here in the Macaulay Library and an incredible sound recordist. Um, so Jay, could you tell us um, in the audience here just some advice on getting started with sound recording? 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's really not not uh, not that hard to to get into sound recording. We live in a, a really cool time right now where pretty much everyone is walking around with a microphone and a recorder in their pocket in the form of a smartphone. You know, you're not going to make maybe like the professional grade recordings with a with a smartphone, but with good technique, you can make some some really decent and really valuable recordings that that can be part of this this archive, this this initiative. So the first thing you need is uh, an app for making a recording, uh, something that records uncompressed files, so not like MP3s or M4As ideally, but WAV files. Uh, we recommend just using Merlin, uh, the built-in sound ID feature, even if you don't necessarily care about getting the, uh, the suggestions for the birds you're hearing, makes really good recording. So you can use it just as a recording app to, to record and save those, share those, and, and uh, ultimately upload those to, to the Macaulay Library. So then in terms of technique, just a couple of, of kind of quick tips. Um, first, get close to the bird. The closer you are to, to the bird, the, the better the recording is going to be, right? The, the louder the bird will be and the, the less background noise there will be. Obviously, try to avoid uh, disturbing the bird or, or scaring it off, but if you can start by approaching a little bit, uh, that'll that'll definitely improve the quality of the of the recordings. And then the second thing is to try to uh, stay quiet, right? Uh, you're going to be closer to your microphone than any any bird is. So any noise you make will really get picked up by the by the microphone, whether you're using a smartphone or or a, some other kind of uh, recording device. So try not to wear swishy clothes, try to stay still, try not to talk during the recording, and then record for a minute or two. The, the better the the better the situation is, the longer it might might be worth uh, making that recording. So that's that's kind of the simple tips. If you want to get more into sound recording, kind of take take them to the next level, there's a number of kind of specialized equipment. That, that you can use. You can use a directional microphone like this. This is a shotgun microphone that's going to pick up more of what it's pointed at than the sounds coming in from the side. So that'll really help kind of focus your recordings and, and make them sound nicer. This one has an adapter that you can actually connect directly to your smartphone, uh, but you can also uh, invest in a dedicated recorder like one of the ones that Glenn was showing before. And actually we have kind of good news on that front. We actually have a really sort of preferred recorder right now that works really well. It's this, it's a Zoom F3. Uh, they'll post a link to some uh, gear recommendations in the chat here in a minute. Um, but this is kind of a top of the line recorder, honestly, right now. It's it's a lot, uh, it makes really nice uh, recordings and it's a lot cheaper than other uh, other recorders in the in the past were of, of similar quality. So really exciting there. And then if you really want to take the take the next step and and be a be a sound recording pro, then you can invest in a parabola. Now this is a bit more cumbersome, right? It's a bit more of a commitment to, to go out in the in the field with this, um, but it's really worth it if you're able to because it really helps focus in, get get it amplifies the the birds that it's pointed at and not the background sound, and so you can really kind of lift those those birds out of the out of the background noise and get a really nice clean recording with that. So not not for everyone, but uh, something to aspire to potentially if, if you're interested in taking recording to the next level. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, those are just a couple a couple ideas, and we really look forward to kind of having your help uh, getting to three million and beyond, like Ali said. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is we want to share today. Um, we developed a sound recording course with the Bird Academy department here at the Cornell Lab a couple of years ago that goes through, it's called How to Record Bird Sounds, and it really goes more in depth with all of those things I just mentioned very quickly in terms of learning about bird song, uh, finding a place in a bird to record, selecting equipment, and uh, the field technique and post-processing afterwards. Um, that's really important too, obviously, to share your recordings, uh, upload them to your eBird checklists. To, to They'll automatically become part of the Macaulay Library and, and help help us all achieve this collective goal. That, uh, that sound recording course is on sale for half off specifically for this event this week. So uh, jump on that. They'll post a, post a link in the chat here too, and otherwise search for how to record bird sounds uh, on Bird Academy. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, to having your help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah. Um, so the, the Macaulay Library really is a resource built by birders, um, just like all of you watching today. 
And I and Jay and Glenn and everyone else here at the Cornell Lab want to give a huge thank you to all of you, to more than 30,000 sound recordists from all around the world who have contributed to the Macaulay Library and to this resource that makes learning about birds more accessible to everybody. Um, thank you all so, so much for sharing your work and helping us better understand birds. And uh, before we go, um, I want to end with a couple things. Um, I have two different videos I want to share. And the first one is just a little bit of inspiration um, with a video that we put together of a couple sound recorders sharing some of their work with us. So I'm going to share that first video now, and then we'll come back for one last goodbye. My favorite recordings was from 2021 when it was at the Amazon forest and a pair of red fan parrots landing on a tree in front of us. about these recordings are not just the vocal calls they perform but also the little notes and whistles they give in between. And I also enjoy that the target species has the vocal attention but you can also hear other species in the background, the little tinamo, the crested orcandla and the Amazonian antipeda giving a sense of the rich soundscape. Listening to that recording takes me right back to that amazing encounter. Hi, my name is Ramit Singhal and I love birding by ear and um, sound recording allows me to delve deeper into that aspect of bird watching and birds themselves and be able to um, understand um, their sounds and their behavior a bit better. Um, a few years ago on my birthday, we went to this remote corner of Southwest Tasmania to watch these birds called the orange belly parrots of which less than a hundred remain in the wild and I was able to make a few sound recordings that to this day remain some of my favorite seva. So I really love recording for quite a few reasons, but the main reason is because when I'm recording, I feel like it's so intimate. It's just me and the bird at that moment in time. And I think there's no better feeling than to have that, you know, your headphones on and you're recording a song or a call and it's just this wonderful moment that you're sharing with this bird. documentation that can really evoke uh, emotions and memories uh, of natural environments and different places. Uh, it enables us to connect sounds with the animal behaviors. Uh, it can spark communications about evolution, ecology and every other topic. The recordings uh, serves as a as a passage that can transport us through time and space. Hello, my name is Will Hirschberger and I love recording bird song. There's nothing like getting a bird focused with your microphone and listening to all the intricacies of what the bird is doing. And then it's really special to be able to take those recordings home and look at the sound spectrograms and see exactly what the bird is doing. That's just magical. One of my favorite recordings is that of a brown thrasher. It appeared to be a female. The male was singing nearby. It was late in the day on a spring evening. And as the light faded, she continued to call, worked her way down into the multiflora rose bush further, and tucked her head under her wing and went to sleep.
And then I thought to myself, now what do I do? I don't want to disturb her and wake her up. So I had to back off super slow and carefully so as not to disturb her. Recording the sounds of birds is a life-changing endeavor. All right, a, a huge thank you again to all the recordists in the video, um, to everyone watching tonight, and to um, all the other um, Cordell Lab staff and guests that spoke on camera today. Um, we're going to turn our cameras off now, um, but I'm going to leave you all with one last video, this time of just some of our personal favorite bird sounds, um, and then the webinar will end after that. Um, so have a great night, everybody, and thank you all for watching. sharing the wrong screen. My bad, my bad. <laughs> One moment, please. We'll get there. Hold on. I promise. <laughs> I promise I have a video. All right, here we go.